Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Indian Institute of Technology and Institute Lecture Series, I am introducing in inertia. I was chairman Institute Lecture Series earlier. Now the new body has come, but the convener has ordered me to take it further and finish my previous assignment. So under that, uh, 35th lecture of the Institute Lecture Series is scheduled today. The topic is liberal education, future of work, and the university. It's a topic which cannot be overemphasized in current days where disengagement of work is costing a country like USA about $370 billion per annum. Disengagement has a huge impact, but we are not realizing that. So probably future of work, when Professor Pankaj Chandra talks on that, will let us understand how to engage an individual with the work he or she is doing in day-to-day -day activities. And lib how liberal education, probably what I'm expecting from it is, that how liberal education is going to contribute to future of work and what will be the role of universities in coming times. The roles are dynamic. There is a D by DT component in universities' functions. Being dynamic, they do change. And uh, we are pretty sure that we have one of the most competent person in higher education landscape of India whose voice and opinions are being heard very seriously by all those who matter in higher education. Therefore, from a competent individual, we would like to learn and understand how higher education should reshape so that its stakeholders re-engage themselves with that. So with that hope and pretty surety, I'm pretty sure that Professor Chandra is going to enlighten us today. I am proud as head of the Department of Mining that he is one of the alumnus of the Department of Mining who has received so much of recognition and acceptance. And today his name is such that it, uh, the moment you say Professor Pankaj Chandra, there is a brand of reliability, acceptance, amicability, and a vision is given. And I was informed yesterday, I was pretty anxious when his session was going on. The moment his session ended, a WhatsApp came to me that it was intellectual treat. And most of the students were engaged full time. And I thanked him at that point of time. I'm pretty sure even this event is going to be a movement which we will cherish lifetime. Because the kind of experience that he has, the exposure that he has. And today, after my exposure, I'm sure that even the exposures do not influence unless your inside talent takes it in right direction. Otherwise, from the same place, people take different kind of exposure. And with similar exposure, people behave differently. So to receive right stimulus and respond positively, you require a persona of the kind of Professor Pankaj Chandra, who has uh, most of the people who are in higher education dream to be a faculty in IIT and I am. Here is a person who has renunciated IIM professorship. He has resigned from it to take, to establish a university that is again uh, of its own kind. So with the first hand experience of building an institution, let us listen a doer who is experimenting his thoughts. So a combination of Krishna and Arjun together. We say the visionaries normally don't execute. Executives normally lack vision many a time. It's a rare combination where the visionaries get an opportunity to execute. We have a combination like uh, Shekhar Sharan sir, in case Adbi is in technology ke field, mein, his visionary also has an opportunity to execute that also. Manoj ji, hai, Dudhi Chua, mein, those of you who go, mining ka jo unhone plan kiya, wahi execute karne mila. Aisa hi Pankaj Chandra ji ko apne educational vision philosophies ko execute karne ke liye koi sponsorer mil gaya. So I find him, his, I envy him and I find that it's a rare, the rarest opportunity available to an individual within his own professional lifetime retire on his pahle hi. Sir ko experiment karne ke liye puri university mil gai hai. 
and the people who gave it are luckier. He is not lucky. The institution is lucky. I am pretty sure we will carve an institution which will not be, I will say, worrying much about these rankings and all those rat race. But if that is missed, the world ranking will have to change its parameters of assessment. That kind of trust I do have in this institution. Now, I, with this introduction of Professor Chandra, I don't know how much justice I have done to your introduction. <laughs> Because uh, you have been seeing, I really didn't get time to structure. So I'll circulate your CV again to faculty.org, the full official CV, so that you know what he is. And we have an institute lecture series established in the institute. Just two more minutes on institute lecture series. Because it's a very coveted series, and all the speakers who have honored us by delivering the lecture have contributed meaningfully to intellectual landscape of IIT BHU in previous years. All their lectures are available in YouTube and you can visit it. Normally, offline se jada, online, usko sites ko views mil rahe hai, visits mil rahe hai. Listen them and few of the students came to me. They said we have listened last 10 institute lectures and our personality has changed. So, I tell you, Please listen their words seriously. With that, I invite Professor Pankaj Chandra to kindly deliver the 31st, 35th Institute Lecture on Liberal Education, Future of Work and the University. To those of just one sentence to those of you who are not from mining. Mr. Shekhar Sharan is presiding today. He is chairman, come managing director, CMPDI Limited, and was director technical, Coal India Limited. He is gold medalist of this department in 1981, and is a celebrity technocrat in the area of mining engineering. He is presiding this. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Sharma. I think you've said more kind words than what I deserve, but. Um, I, uh, many of us believe that um, we have a responsibility to make this new institution look very differently. Professor Shekhar Saran, thank you very much for chairing this and, and being here. He was my senior <coughs> in the department and has always inspired many of us um, right from the day when we came in. Um, actually, my talk is in three parts. The first part is around work. What is happening globally um, in India <clears throat> around work? Uh, and, and what is its implication? The second part is, um, what is this liberal education that we are talking about? And the third part is on, um, on, on uh, what is the role of universities or how universities must adapt themselves very differently. Uh, please tell me um, when I have to stop about five minutes or so before that so that I can then close up. <coughs> um, yeah. um, so there, according to me, there are three very big forces of change around the world. One um, that you all are familiar with, and that's climate change. And it's going a little bit beyond the usual. <coughs> We've heard a lot about climate change. We've heard a lot about um, what it is doing to temperatures and what it is doing to um, areas and snow caps that are melting or, or areas where um, colder temperatures are now being seen, which would never happen. In. Beyond that, there are phenomenal implications that are going to affect all our lives. And that's around health. Um, climate change is creating very new <coughs> kinds of pathogens that, is, that are going to um, largely change the way um, we, are, we live a sustainable life. Social practices are changing very dramatically. Long time ago, uh, when I was a kid, I remember we would go up to the rooftop and sleep on rooftop. We would have everybody post dinner come and sleep. Um, and sit and talk, and that brought a very different sense of community. 
Um, today, it's actually temperature um, which is changing all of it. Uh, the second <coughs> um, driver of this change is urbanization. Um, there is a forecast which says that by 2090, the top 10 densest uh, uh, cities will actually be in Africa and India. Um, the densest would be Lagos uh, in Nigeria, but of this 10, 7 would be from India. Now, it has very major implications, <coughs> major implications on housing, major implications on mobility. Skills is another thing <coughs> within the city, the pressures on in mobilization. We are seeing now large multi-story towers coming to increase space efficiency. But every day in the morning and evening, you have large number of people coming out on the main road, creating enormous amount of congestion. It has led to um, um, I mean growth of cars and fuel consumption, and consequently pollution and health. Uh, uh, there's large in-migration that's happening from rural areas into urban. And, and the urban is going to get defined very, very dramatically. And the question we'll ask, so who takes care of the rural? Will the rural exist? What will happen to agriculture? <clears throat> Who does agriculture? Do large corporations do agriculture? Because individual farmers will sell and move out into urban centers. And it's a very major challenge. The third, <clears throat> um, uh, the third driver is technology. And much is being talked about, but I, I want to, I, I don't want to talk too much on it, but you know, last night I was talking about this historian, this historian from Israel. If you've not read him, please do read. <coughs> His name is Yuval Noah Harari, H-A-R-A-R-I. He's written two books, Homo Deus and, and, and Sapiens, and his third book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, just come out. And a very, very interesting individual who looks at technology over centuries. So his focus is not today, tomorrow, five years, 10 years. He says, <clears throat> 3,000 years ago, what was the um, technology? What were people doing? Uh, from 2000 to, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, year zero century to 2000, what happened? And now what's happening? And there's some very interesting, revealing questions that he raises. One um, is that um, the Neanderthal or those um, who predated us 3,000 years ago actually worked for survival. They brought, whenever they needed to hunt, they built the tools, they hunted, came back, and then they sat and did nothing because I, there was food. Um, in the last two, <coughs> um, 2,000 years, um, mankind has started to... Um, um, so, so the first... Uh, several years, uh, several thousand years is all about food. The last two, three thousand, two thousand years have been very much about survival. So you keep working because you have to survive. You keep working till you're 70 or 80 or 90 and every day you are trying to get a sense of what is it that I must do tomorrow. Um, but this coming century um, of technology is once again looks like creating automation to a level whereby for most standard tasks you do automation and consequently you have to ask a question, so what do you and I do? If most standard tasks, um, lifts bring us up, um, cars take us outside, ACs keep us cool, um, there'll be uh, robots that will clean sewer lines, there'll be drones that will look at mining data, There'll be all kinds of stuff, and it's, I'm not talking um, out of the blue, but it is starting to happen just now. Puneet and his team were showing us some very interesting ideas on, 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 on virtual reality and augmented virtual reality that they are wanting to build that has implication on very standard routine tasks. So the question becomes, what do you and I do? Are we becoming like the Neanderthal? who was 3,000 years, so I will go work, do some stuff, come back, and we don't know what to do. It's, it's, a, it's a reality, it may happen 100 years from now, it may happen 50 years from now, but it is for large number of people it's starting to happen. 
So whether it is the autonomous car, um, world over there's experiments in India, the government thinks that it doesn't want to touch it, um, but I think uh, sooner than later um, they will have to think about, about it. The biochip, uh, the latest chip is a biochip, it's no longer a silica based chip which you stick it into your arm <clears throat> and it collects data on your bi you know I'm stepping huh? okay okay and 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 I'm um, I mean it collects data um, I recently I was mentioning to some people that I stuck up this device um, and which collects blood sugar data every 15 minutes and it's a small needle with a disc, big disc and you just stick it in and it, it collects your one week's worth of data um, and, and 14 days actually is the validity of this piece. Now that's becoming reality. This is wearable technology. This is wearable on the body. Um, I don't know if you've read about this guy who has created an antenna, a sixth sense for himself. He's saying this is a new sense that I have created smell and touch and other thing, but I have another antenna where I can see what's happening behind me. So it's a very strange, I mean these are still looking very futuristic, so did the nuclear bomb until it was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so there is that issue, graphene the, uh, is, is making uh, planes and many other products very, very light. Um, the ubiquitous net um, has changed uh, all our lives very, very dramatically <clears throat> and, 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 and the, the, the challenge is that there are scientists working on autonomous machines. Autonomous machines are those that can do more than what the designer made it to do. So I've programmed you to say hello, but the AI within that system says hello and good morning because it's able to parse all the words and create a sentence and say a few other things. Now that becomes, it's a reality today. I mean, it's, it's, starting to, it's starting to happen at a lab scale at many other places. And that's really where the fear of many technologists lie. If the, if the scientist who has designed this machine is not able to control this machine, then I think we have a very major challenge going forward. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that is happening. Um, there was an, <clears throat> um, I mentioned last night also, there's a very big um, well-known um, business head um, who used to meet me very often <clears throat> for several years and every time I would go to him he would ask, aur kya naya ho raha hai? Kya tumhare dimag mein naya chal raha hai? And I'll, first couple of times I would, I kind of, whatever, I was seeing, observing, thinking, I would narrate. Then I realized that here's a person who's actually picking my mind. He's trying to figure out what am I seeing, what am I reading, and so I, I would get prepared. So once I landed up and he asked me, so what is it that you're thinking? So I'm, I'm from the world of management and I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about the future of organizations. What would an organization look like? So he said, you know, this is exactly what I was thinking too. And, and tell me, how do you react to it? And his question was, suppose <clears throat> I bring in, I'm producing a product. And he, I don't want to name, but there was a product. He says, in preparing, the, making this product, I get somebody from Korea, somebody from Israel, somebody from um, uh, US, somebody from India, somebody from all over the world, put a project team, um, they work two years, somebody works six months, eight months, three years, five years, and then they delivered the product, I take it to the market, and then I assemble another team. And this team is very different. So I, my question to this person was, so war, where is your organization? He says, that's my question to you. Where is my organization? And I said, you have to first define what's an organization. Because organizations gave lifelong employment, organizations gave loyalty, demanded loyalty, organizations gave, built a community, organizations had a character in terms of the nature of people who came there with a common vision and a purpose. But if they, that configuration is changing, um, 
what is an organization? It's a very real question. What then happens to the person who's coming to work here? I am an autonomous subcontractor. How do I go outside? Um, what are uncertainties regarding my own life? Um, and I think uh, if I was such a person doing it, I'll actually try to ex ex exact a maximum amount from every project because I don't know what's going to happen to me in the next project. That changes completely the character of the society. So <clears throat> the point I'm making is many of us who actually were born five decades, more than five decades ago, couldn't have imagined it. Um, and I, I, I mentioned, you know, I've, I've, been, I've had a ra rather standard life where I've been in the same industry, which is university and academia. And I have, uh, I've changed jobs, but I've been exactly in the same industry. Many of you will have to, um, I haven't changed industry, but you will have to change five or six industries over the next five or six types of work over the next 30, 40 years of your life. And if that happens, the question then becomes, what is education? What do you learn? Where is it that, how do you prepare for this eventuality? I'm, I'm at this point, point of time kind of um, elevating the apprehension. I'm not saying this is exactly that may happen, but there's a likelihood, there's a probability that it just might happen this or even more. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, what is your role in this world? Interestingly, two organizations haven't changed despite all of this. One is the university, and the second is a religious organization. Both want others to listen to them, and both don't want to change. Um, and, and I'm less qualified to talk about the second one, but I will talk about the first one a little bit later as to what is happening to the university. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me, um, let me um, uh, point to you what is this phenomenon, um, how is this phenomenon changing the society? So, um, I, until recently, I sat on the board of this mid-sized IT company called uh, Mindtree. And Mindtree is going to go $1 billion <coughs> um, kind of revenue very soon. <coughs> and, and every time we would do a conversation, um, we would try to see what is happening to work. And there was a very interesting case study that somebody presented from elsewhere. It was not from Mindtree. Um, and that was that here is a young kid who graduates from some college with computer science degree or I think mechanical or some other. Today everybody, the only engineering looks like that matters is computer science. Everybody else is no engineering. I mean, it's a very strange world we are heading towards. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and this person was tasked by the company to go and work on Zurich Airport. And the job was at Zurich Airport to essentially um, do a scheduling algorithm for scheduling um, planes that are arriving at different gates. So there are 30 gates, and you have to do the scheduling of the planes. And it depends on, on many, many things. How you, They scheduled it. It was a beautiful piece of, um, of, of, of coding. It was a beautiful piece of software. It bombed. And it bombed because um, they failed to realize when they were taking this into account, that the biggest source of revenue at Zurich Airport, and by the way, in most airports, is not tickets. It's actually sale of food and beverage. So if I have a gate and I have a bar next to it that everybody comes into, and I schedule the busiest kind of a flight on that, then actually I do very well. But if I, um, uh, I use some other algorithm, you just bomb. Now this young coder did not know anything about this world of consumer or the retail or everything else. And here was a solution which was just <coughs> not up to the mark. Now, <coughs> where is this going? <coughs> so let me point to you, in my mind, there are four axes of attention. I, I attend to four axes. The first axis 
comprises data, materials, biology, and behavior. So that's one axis, think of it, on which you lie data, materials, biology, and behavior. The second axis is where change is happening. And by the way, this is the areas of change. Second axis is around health, transport, energy, and food. Who would have imagined that you would have private companies running airports in India? Who would have imagined in, when I was growing up that health care was to be provided by private um, enterprises completely? <clears throat> Um, and that is, is a phenomenal change. Same is happening on food and same is happening on, 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 on energy. The third axis is air, water, land, forest. These are very, very contested areas. And, and, and I, we were talking this morning with um, Ajay Kumar Singh and the challenges that they are facing in terms of, and, and Mr. Shekhar Saran around um, uh, around the environment in the mining area and its land rights and so on and so forth. And it's a very major, major challenge. The fourth axis comprises of individual and community. Now, <clears throat> why are they worth our attention, these four axes? First, many disciplines, academic disciplines around, revolve around it. Data, the many is math, computer science, statistics, all of them revolve around the world of data. Uh, materials, it's all engineering, sciences, manufacturing, many of those areas. In biology, life sciences, ecology, environment, all of them are kind of linked in that world. Uh, behavior, it's sociology, anthropology, philosophy, psychology, and most of management actually is study of individual behavior and behavior of organizations. Uh, <clears throat> that's what largely, and, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, it was always said that the strength of a BHU engineer was this phenomenal interpersonal skills because we were able to manage our mess guys very, very well. But it's very important in any which way that you do. Now, the challenges lie on each of these four axes, but the best part is that the opportunities lie at the intersection of these axes. This is where the new future of work that seems to be emerging. To give you an example, <clears throat> um, I gave you this example of the Zurich airport. It involves data, first axis. It involved transportation, the second axis. It involved air, the third axis. It involved individual travel, the fourth axis. Now, we'll see, you'll say, so what? What's the big deal about it? The big deal is that I need to know about all four axes to be able to optimize my business in this particular world. Same is the case with uh, public health. If, you're a, if you go and become a consultant for a public health or an NGO, you have behavior as one axis, you have health as a second axis, you have water, if you're working in water as a third axis, and you have a community. <clears throat> and you need to understand about each one of them. How does the community engage with, with, the, with the health? How does the health engage with behavior? How do people, and I'll come a little bit more about it as, the, as we go. So these are, these intersection of axes is really where new jobs are occurring. Old jobs, old areas, I think jobs are becoming very standardized and will get automated. Um, I mean, mining has become very automated in quite some ways, and it's going to increasingly <clears throat> become one. When, when Puneet was showing Mr. Shekhar Saran, a video which is just a preliminary one, his instant reaction was, you know what, this is very exciting, please come to Ranchi, let's discuss and talk. So it looks like head of the country's most sophisticated organization in this industry um, is also thinking about many of these areas, and it's very important to, to, to think about it. Now, how does one prepare for these kind of new jobs? Because it's not, I do just plain simple my mechanical engineering, heat engines, thermodynamics, all of that drawing, all the shebang that goes in or, or any other discipline, um, it doesn't prepare you. So what do I do to be able to, <coughs> to, to, to cut across these? 
And, 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 and what does um, this how to learn mean? And I think the, the, the thing that um, we can do at this particular juncture is, you know, information is all available on the net. Information is data. Um, about 15 years ago, when I was at IIM Ahmedabad, we would go teach a case study from Harvard. And we were the only guys who had access to Harvard case studies, and that was our competitive advantage. Harvard saw this as a business opportunity. It says, okay, my God, looks like Indians love cases. They opened their case studies to everybody. So everybody is starting, now what is my competitive advantage? So I have to develop my competitive advantage very, very um, differently. So information is no longer competitive advantage. Knowledge is no longer sufficient because knowledge is changing. I, I, I used to teach operations management, and which is largely inventory, lean, production planning, scheduling. All of it is gone now from the classroom. It's actually, it's been elevated into large softwares that are sitting somewhere that will help people do. And you are not the one that is, the manager is not the one who is actually making decisions about it. They're taking, they're taking that big software, dumping the data, getting schedules out, and then, so the disciplines are changing very, very dramatically. So knowledge gets completely, by the time an idea comes into a book, it's almost 10 years old. When my book came out in 2017, actually it was work that started in 2010. So it's already outdated, it's all gone. <clears throat> so what do you do? If, if data is not available, uh, is not kosher, and I think the only skill that we can, um, we can learn and teach to manage this phenomenal uncertainty is about how to learn. How do you learn? After you leave college, we're all learning on our own. You look at others and you say, okay, this is how this guy does. You read, you learn. We're all doing self-learning. We might go for a program for six days or seven days and here and there, but largely you're doing self-learning. And, and it is this how to learn which is actually going to change the way we manage this changing technology. Otherwise, we would be in in trouble. <clears throat> now, that kind of brings me to the second part of my talk. So if this is what is happening to work, if this is the uncertainty that seems to be kind of navigating the world's corridors, <clears throat> and if this is how tech, urbanization, um, and, and climate change are inter interacting with each other, um, my um, my, um, uh, rec my, my hypothesis is that we need to learn and teach how to learn. Now, let me talk a little bit about this how to learn because it is, <clears throat> it's very nebulous. Because what do you mean? Uh, I'm, I'm sure when I, I'm sure you'll ask, so what does this mean how to learn? Uh, when I go into a classroom, I do some stuff, yeah, I learn. But you're telling me develop a method a course called How to Learn, <clears throat> and, and I think let me, it needs a little bit of, of, um, evaluate, um, uh, of explanation. I very strongly believe that for imagination, because it's through imagination that you're going to be able to address this uncertainty. I don't think through existing paradigms we can address this. We have to imagine. We have to imagine along with these Silicon Valley guys, we have to imagine along with these other um, IPCC and environment folks. And this imagination happens <clears throat> through research. And, and, and research is not about winning a prestige by publishing a paper or doing a research, it's about curiosity. Research is about trying to think about an issue. Um, and research is about um, talking about a problem. So you're really talking problem solving, and problem solving, um, a PhD student, by the way, does that. A PhD student's world is you get into a problem, get in deep, and, and, and you do research. 
you pick up tools, you pick up methods, you do some modeling, you do something else, you inquire, you pose a question, you answer a question, you turn down a hypothesis, you generate a new hypothesis. That's how the research progresses. Um, that world is the world that then teaches you to imagine. And that imagination is what needs to be, that research, that imagination needs to be brought into, into, the, into the classroom at an undergraduate level. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention, so, so the point I'm saying, when there's uncertainty about the future, you need to learn how to learn. You don't focus on knowledge, you don't focus on data, because tomorrow that world will change this knowledge will change, this data will change, then what? I have to learn some very standard principles which will allow me um, to, to, to question. And, and research is always about questioning. I am using this word research, you can call whatever you want. Yeah, it is not truly in the sense of an academic research, but um, it is largely problem solving that I am talking about. <clears throat> and you need to be skilled into this process of problem solving. How do you go solve a problem? So design thinking, some people come up and say, okay, you know what, design thinking is a method that will help you solve problem. Okay, good, that's one of it. Critical thinking is another one. How do you look at critiquing um, very constructively? Um, analytical thinking is another way in which you do. Independent mindedness is another competence that one develops which says, you know what, I am going to ask a very independent minded question. I am not going to be influenced by this guy or that guy. Um, that's, so how do you train in the, into these processes? Engineering does not train you. Into. Engineering um, trains you into the laws of physics and laws of mathematics, because en engineers, engineering training is largely engineering science. Science is all about search of truth. And, 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 and that is really what we are wanting to, that is what IITs have done and, and I think that is why they are not going anywhere. Because you do not, they are not problem solvers, most, most of them. And that creates an enormous amount of challenge in mind. So, everybody is a theoretician. Everybody comes out from a university or an IIT or institution and say, ab real world mein aare, abhi tak to theory well, that's bad. I mean, if you have to do that for five years or seven years of your life, I think it's a waste, complete waste of time. Uh, and, 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 and let me explain this through a question, very simple question, <clears throat> which will make this issue very real for you. Um, because it's this imagination which is cultivated through research, which is cultivated through series of ways of doing things, problem solving and analytical thinking, critical thinking and where is that coming from? Where is that story coming from? So, suppose I pose a question, so I, I, I call a group of multidisciplinary people into this room. I call a psychologist, philosopher, um, a scientist, an engineer and a behavioral economist, um, Daniel Kahneman who got the Nobel Prize for behavioral economy, I make these guys sit down. And I pose a question and I pose this question how do you reduce congestion at Lanka gate? Okay. Now, there is a crossing, any crossing you can imagine, the Lanka gate, is upar congestion hota hai, isko kaise? And I say, you have to ask only one question, that is the foremost question that comes to your mind. Now, what would a sociologist say? The sociologist would say, why do we not follow the right of way? If I have reached that crossing first, then I should actually go first. But that does not happen, that it, it does not happen. Um, the marketing manager, if there is a marketing guy sitting in there will say, what kind of communication will make people respect the right of way? The engineer, <coughs> signal processing con communications engineer if you may, may say, well what kind of communication signal do I give to people? who are approaching that crossing which will facilitate the flow, that is their thinking. Um, an urban planner or a logistics expert will say, does the design of the roundabout impact the right of way and consequently the e efficiency of the logistics system? That is the question that that individual discipline asks. 
A philosopher would say, is the right of way a fairness question? Why are you even asking this question? You know, that's what a philosopher would, would say. A psychologist would say, do people who are more anxiety prone respect the right of way or less or more? You know, a behavioral economist will say, ask a question, does the attitude of drivers towards the right of way vary during the day or the evening? And can I put a pricing mechanism that will change their behavior? A behavioral neuroscientist will ask a question, what happens to the neural connects of an individual? And they'll put all stuff and say, okay, we do an experiment, you go into this crossing, let's see, let's measure what's happening to the neurons and what connections are being made when you approach the, the, the and, and, and an automobile engineer would say, you know, what should be the safe speed to braking ratio as a car approaches a road crossing? I better care, take care of that. Now, <clears throat> these are many questions from different disciplines. None of them solve this problem. None. Not one of them will solve this problem. And that's why this problem continues. So what do you do? You have to amalgamate many of this kind of questioning. Many of these hypothesis into a research frame. That's what education is all about. That's what liberal education does. A liberal education is about asking a question from many, many which ways. Um, we're doing, a, <clears throat> we're doing a, at Ahmedabad University a foundation program. So for about seven months, every undergrad, irrespective of the discipline, whether you are electrical engineer or you are a music major, all go through this seven a uh, month of, and it's around many of these questions, and there are four studios that they do. One of the studio is water, and, and there are six professors from very interdisciplinary disciplines. There's a hydrologist, there are data scientists, there's a psychologist, there's a public, health, a public uh, economy person, um, and, and there's one more. They come together, they ask questions. What are six questions? that I must get my students to ask, which will put the problem of water, the most central problem there. That is liberal education. And what it does is you bring the best from humanities. And humanities is not learning about pride and prejudice. Humanities is not learning about Mahashweta Devi's Draupadi. Humanities is not learning about Shakespeare. It's actually learning about critical thinking. And if you think, how do you critique? Why did the person say what it did? Why did the person act in this particular manner? That's critical thinking. Um, and and I, it's very, very crucial <coughs> that, that that line of questioning starts to build in people's mind. Um, and, and, and then with many other tools of liberal art, science, whatever you may call it, I, I like to term, call the term liberal education. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's much more holistic that it allows you to learn how to learn. It gives you the tools on which you base um, a broad education and then a depth. It's a more of a T model um, that you, you um, I mean, I was asking, I was mentioning in this morning that I don't know why, um, why we, the various departments of engineering school are located at BHU. Why should we not? break them up and make the various departments located all over the place. Nothing will change. Nothing will change <clears throat> because we don't interact with them. I mean, there's a small percentage that would do. We don't interact with them. We don't, well, we don't take courses across different departments, very few. We don't do research together. We don't solve problems together. We don't attack issues. So why should we be why is a business, uh, uh, engineering school comprised in this particular manner? It only makes sense if, if there is interaction. Just because some stupid AICTE has, or UGC has said that you should have a department, should be no reason for having that. I think it is destroying the way we learn. It is destroying how we learn. That how part of it gets destroyed because you learn some of the how from one discipline, some other part of the how to learn from other discipline, and so on and so forth. 
and you collectively get to solve problems, which is really what life is largely all about. <clears throat> um, if, I, if I relate that to, to your, to an engineering school, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, any problem, when you go to solve a problem, um, you do a feasibility, right? Feasibility of an idea or a proof of concept is actually done by the engineers and the technical technology people. Its viability is done by the business folks or the economists. They see whether technically, economically, it's feasible. I'm not saying economists, I'm saying people who have knowledge of that and it could be technical people. Um, but the desirability of that idea, which we completely miss out, actually <clears throat> comes from humanities and arts. Whether this solution of a roundabout at Lanka Crossing is desirable or not, nobody asked us. Nobody did a survey to ask the students of BHU or people out there, that I am making a chakkar here, what will this gold chakkar do? Is it okay or not? Is it okay or not? And that kind of questioning, that participation is very, very crucial in managing societies um, as we, we, we <coughs> go a little bit um, uh, further. So it's, it's the intersection of, of this feasibility, which is engineering, uh, viability, which is business and economics, and desirability, which is largely humanities and social science. It's the intersection of them that actually gives you liberal education. Now the question is, we mess it up. We mess it up because we say, take a course in humanistic studies, take a course in value education, take a course in political science, take a course in economics, take a course in psychology. I think you are perpetuating the same problem which we are critiquing here for an engineering school. Because the problem exists in humanities and languages also. So the way to do it is to bring them together and offer a course which is an amalgam of many of these disciplines. And, and, and I think um, for an engineering, for an IIT, there's no better place to do it than BHU. This is an absolute wonder. <clears throat> um, it's a shame that we are not able to cross the boundaries or, um, or, or, or run the bureaucracies down or the politics down to be able to do which other institution will have this privilege? Um, and, and we've, for instance, at Ahmedabad University, we've created an uh, environment where the kid can, every course is available to every kid. You can take anything you want. Kids will take a course in, um, in biology, they're doing biology, but they'll take a course in accounting, they'll take a course in, 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 in mechanical engineering. We've just set up a new minor, which is called general engineering for non-engineers. I'm a literature major. Why should I not learn about engineering? It's about fabrication. Five minutes. Five minutes. Good, thank you. So that actually brings me to the third and the last part of it. And, and that's really <clears throat> the two ubiquitous organizations that I talked to you about. Um, and the religious group and the, the university. Um, they all want us to only learn information. They'll only want to tell us 3,000 years ago, kya hua, kon aya, kon gaya. Usse kya knowledge nikalti hai, usse kya vyohar banta hai, usse kya hota hai, uske baare mein na unko pata hai, na unko, unke mat ko pata hai. So I think that's a really big challenge on that front. We in education have also practically become like that. And we've become simply because, um, because since 1950s, um, we have completely taken over the running of institutions by the government. And when a government takes over institutions and it wants to control, it will only do it by standardization. It will make sure that there is a stupid AICT that sets out a curriculum that every institution follows. And, and, and actually, who will go to set those curriculum? God knows. Um, when the fact remains, everybody must experiment. If everybody, every institution experiments within the framework of guidelines that you have to have 120 credits or 40 credits, these are the things that broadly you do, then there are new things that will arise out of university. So um, that's been one major problem 
associated with universities, and universities are now run by governments. They're not run by academics. They're run by political parties, they're run by governments, and, 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 and they place whoever they want to place as heads of institutions. Um, the decision making, and this is, this is never, ever, um, um, I, I could ever think of it. The decision of who is going to be head of institution is made out of town. The committee that makes the decision never visits the institution, never meets the faculty, never meets the students, can't figure out what is the need of that institution at that juncture. What kind of a leader do they want? Um, and that is a very, very major challenge. The standardization of learning, as I mentioned, because of the curriculum, the standardization that's taking place because of the examination system, and that needs to, to, to actually uh, break down. Um, and, and the last is, um, I think, the kind of evaluation that we do. We are teaching to evaluation. We're not teaching to learning. And unless that part changes very dramatically, this flexibility in our environment, flexibility in what we do, um, uh, how do I make my classroom more relevant to what is problem solving? It becomes a huge, huge challenge to be able to, um, um, to, be able to meet the how to learn part of it in any kind of setting. Today, our institutions are not ready. Many institutions, by the way, globally are not ready. We are not the only ones, but I think India um, has a very, very long way to go. Um, and unless those barriers, those boundaries, those ways of thinking are, are destroyed, I mean, I, I want to use that word, are destroyed, um, it's going to be very difficult to build the edifice of a new educational environment that is catering to the future and not to the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pankajandra. A beautiful, absorbing, interesting, almost one hour session. I remember Pankaj since uh, 1788. Uh, when he joined first year. Uh, he has been a very good orator throughout, I mean, at, at the beginning itself. And if I'm not wrong, uh, your group started publishing a view mon uh, magazine. I think that translates is a beautiful word or something like that. You are, uh, I mean, the pioneer of that magazine. I'm talking about 78, 79. Hmm? So, uh, he, he had that talent right at that moment. And you can understand, I was two years seniors to him. And uh, I still remember the quality of this group, the batch of uh, 78. Uh, is, it was a very, uh, very promising and very good batch. I think most of you are at the top positions. Huh? Mm. So, last anyway. I think the lecture series on this uh, liberalized education, future of work, and the University of Dr. Sharma, he has been conducting uh, this was the 35th lecture series, I suppose. Um, congratulations, Dr. Sharma. And uh, uh, I, I wish uh, I could have been part of the many more lectures what I had listened. Uh, one thing can be, I think Dr. Pankaj Chandra is uh, one of the uh, most brilliant modern day alumnus of uh, IIT BH Humanity Department. Uh, we are fortunate to have Pankaj with us. And uh, Pankaj, uh, I hope uh, he will, will be blessing many department with your uh, uh, frequent uh, visits. BH uh, IIT Department needs your uh, blessings. Uh, very good, I think, introduction part was uh, by Professor Sharma. It was also very, very, um, I mean, uh, exhaustive, very to the point. And uh, he was also talking about the changing of personalities of 10 candidates per, per, per uh, lecture. I think uh, that's a very good idea. And um, uh, that is going to change the perception of the studies, what we do. Uh, like uh, Professor Chandra was telling that, uh, now I, I must come to three idiots part. 
you might, I don't know if you, know, if you know, Pankaj, Professor Pankaj Chandra was the man who helped Amir Khan in preparing three years film. If you see the acknowledgement part, at the end of that acknowledgement part, Professor Chandra's name is there. And uh, Professor Chandra, I would request if you can share some of your experiences with the, uh, with, just after this uh, analysis. Uh, you can, what, whatever he has just discussed, I was just going through those uh, uh, points and I was remembering that three idiots to the same cheese. Amir Khan was telling me, Kya tum log engineering padne aayo, or ratta maane aayo, ek karne aayo. That's exactly Professor Chandra was, I think, uh, having this uh, discussion with all of you. Hardware of three idiots is all. Huh? Exactly. Uh, as far as mining engineering, mining engineering is uh, such a, uh, is, is a branch, jaha aap go, you need finance, you need electrical, mechanical, electronics, hydraulics, uh, ex in environment science, biology, medical, health. Yeah, now it is you are uh, having a lot of uh, IT involvement, IoT involvement, AI involvement, machine learning, everything, all the fields are there. So mining may, if you are uh, targeting, uh, suppose a mine is engaging 200, 300 person in India, I'm talking about, you know, open cast mine. We are having 300 to 400 manpower and we are producing say 20 to 30 million cubic meter uh, uh, of uh, mineral. I'm talking not only of coal, but in mineral. I think the Rampur Ahucha, they are handling around 100 million ton of uh, volume every year. Million ton, if you consider. Um, coal India, they are having Gebra projects, 40 million ton. And NCL, the number of projects who are producing, how many? 20, 25 million ton capacity projects. Engaging how many? Only 100. 100 maybe 100 manpower per ship and maybe it will be translating into say 600, 700 manpower only because of this uh, technological uh, involvement. A lot of uh, involvement of these applications, the application of these technologies. So I think the you know, mining engineer has to be, they, there is a professor, you are telling that uh, mining engineering is what we were told, mining engineer is the jack of all trades, master of none. They, he can manage anything, but he has to be the jack of all trades, master of none. Now the, the change is going to be done. Okay, so, so those are the um, sayings that we were listening to. And really, the field was that we have never learned HR. I think HR, HR was not our uh, part of the uh, curriculum, but day one, say, when we went into the mine, we had to manage around 300 to 400 underground workers in our shift, we were made the shift in charges. Raj sir is here, there used to be 400 persons in all illiterate. Sab ke sab jhola, kya belcha, chhodi leke mine mein aana hai, raat ke 12 se 8 tak you are at the mercy of those persons. 600, 700, 800 men power hai. But you have to manage. HR nahi padaya gaya hum logo, but lekin manage kiya. Anyway, thik hai. So, jaysa aap professor Chandra ne bata hai, I think it has been a very I mean, uh, absorbing uh, uh, session. I thank you, Professor Chandra, for uh, um, uh, having this lecture, and we hope that we'll be having many more lectures of this kind. And thank you, Professor Sharma, and your team for organizing, organizing this lecture. Thank you very much. Can I, can I have your experience of three years? Uh, Sir, if you permit, I would like to add a piece of information huh? for students here. Sir, Sir, Sir Professor A.K. Department, Dean of Resources and Adul Sir, 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 please. Sir, please, sir, pass the position. That's it. He must join us. He must join us in inaugural. I just wanted to add a piece of information, maybe at the cost of repetition. It may have been told in the beginning itself. Professor Pankaj Chandra is the first person who wrote about why ITBHU should become IIT. And he was in the team uh, that met, uh, that met uh, Minister Achari and Secretary Achari when we started this crusade. So this we should remember for all times to come, that he has been in the journey of making of IIT, the, IIT, the Institute of Technology, Madras University. Just I wanted to add that.